Chapter 18, Trapped. There's nothing in the secret drawer. Mr. March groaned in disappointment. The thief got here first and took it all. Here's a card with writing on it, said Nancy, reaching in and taking out the message. Maybe it gives further directions. Read it to me, Mr. March directed. Nancy was so excited that the words tumbled from her mouth. Here, in telltale handwriting, was a splendid clue to the man who had stolen the March songs and to the person who had them published as his own original compositions. Mr. March requested that the girl repeat it. Riggin, can't you find another good song? D. D for Deitch, you think? Mr. March asked. I'm sure of it, Nancy replied elated at the discovery. But who can Riggin be? Whoever he is, he must have dropped this card when he was searching for the songs. At that instant, Effie appeared in the doorway. Isn't anybody going to eat supper? It'll be stone cold pretty soon. The maid's words brought the searchers back to reality. Why, yes, Effie, we'll be right down, Mr. March said. You two look awful funny. Did something happen? Effie inquired. We've had a surprise, that's all, Nancy answered. But we didn't find what we'd hoped to. Before leaving the secret room, Mr. March decided to nail up the skylight so the intruder could not get in again. He called to Effie to bring hammer and nails from his toolbox in the basement. But it's like locking the barn door after the horse has been stolen, he said dolefully. Maybe not, said Nancy, a new thought coming to her. You know the intruder hasn't been back since we frightened him away. Whatever he wanted hasn't been taken yet. True enough, the elderly man agreed. There's still a ray of hope. Just where to look next puzzles me, said Nancy. I'd like to sit down quietly and think things out. Effie returned with hammer and nails. The skylight was securely fastened. Then they all went downstairs. During supper, no mention was made of the secret room. Susan was eating with her grandfather and Nancy, and they did not want to excite the child. It was not until the little girl had gone to the kitchen after the meal to talk to Effie that Mr. March divulged to Nancy what he proposed to do that evening. I have a hunch that fellow Riggin is going to come back here tonight. Well, he'll be my prisoner before he knows what's happening. You mean you'll notify the police? Indeed not. This old soldier is going to capture the thief alone. Nancy was aghast and started to object. Nothing would please me more than to get my hands on the fellow who stole Phipps' work, Mr. March insisted. Nancy could not persuade him to change his mind. She offered to accompany him, but he would not let her. You said you wanted to think things out, Mr. March reminded her. Maybe an idea will come to you and you'll go back to the old attic and search for the rest of my son's music. At least let's arrange a signal, Nancy pleaded. Couldn't you imitate some kind of an animal sound to let me know if the man shows up? Mr. March grinned. I can try hooting like an owl. Good, I'll listen for it. Saying he would post himself near the old servants' quarters, Mr. March went outdoors quietly. Nancy had some misgivings about his going, but said nothing. She put Susan to bed, then came downstairs. Effie soon finished her work and retired. The young detective was left alone. For an hour, Nancy sat in the living room, thinking. She reviewed the various angles of the two strange cases in which she and her father had become involved. The hardest work is yet to come, she mused. And that will be to go into court and prove that the two Mr. Dites are guilty. They've both stolen something. But how different the two products are! 
realizing it would cost Mr. March a great deal of money to carry out his plan of prosecuting the plagiarist. Nancy could not help but wish that there were some way to locate more of Phipps' music. Her thoughts turned suddenly to the piano desk. Why, there may be another secret drawer in it, she concluded suddenly. Excited, Nancy jumped up and started for the attic, carrying a candle. As she reached the third floor, a clock chimed. She smiled. The witching hour of midnight, and I hope all's well, she quoted. Nancy started her new investigation of the piano desk. The utter stillness and the close atmosphere had a depressing effect upon her. She began to breathe more quickly as first one sound, then another made her uneasy. They seem so far away, she thought. I wonder if I would hear Mr. March if he should call. For a long moment, Nancy stood still, hesitant to go on with her work. Maybe she ought to run downstairs to be near the elderly man if he needed her. I'll hurry with my search, she decided. Nancy pressed first one area, then another on the left-hand side of the old piece of furniture. No drawer came out. She tried again and again, then switched to the right-hand side. At last, her efforts were rewarded. Slowly, a shallow tray moved out from the middle of the old piano desk. It was filled with papers. Nancy's pulse was beating wildly, but she forced herself to be calm. She carried the tray to the table, then took out several scrolls and folded papers. Nancy scanned them hastily. As she had hoped, they were all musical compositions. The name Philip March Jr. was signed in a bold scrawl at the top of each song. These have never been published, Nancy thought elatedly. That thief didn't find them. Her imagination was spinning as she hummed one lovely air after another and realized what hits they would make. Nancy could picture the shabby old mansion restored to its former grandeur. Little Susan would be getting a fine education. Mr. March. Nancy was so absorbed in her thoughts, she failed to notice that the piano desk was moving slowly and silently across the floor. It stopped. Then, noiselessly, a man raised himself through a hole. He began to smile. So, she found them for me, he gloated. Nancy, unaware that her every move was being watched, rolled up the manuscripts. As she started to pick up the candle, the young sleuth became aware of a sound behind her. Nancy froze to the spot. The stealthy intruder confronted her. Before she could scream, he grabbed her in a powerful grip and put one hand over her mouth. Bushy trot! She gurgled behind his fat fingers. Mr. Riggentrot, if you please, he corrected her with a sneer. I see you remember me. Well, I remember you. Tried to spy on me at the Dite Factory, didn't you? Well, that didn't get you anywhere. Nancy fought to escape from the man, but his clutch was like an iron vice. He whipped out a handkerchief and stuffed it into her mouth. Deftly, he produced two pieces of rope from his pocket. Always carry these for emergencies, he announced with a low chuckle. Use them for people who don't mind their own business. I threw a stone at old man March at your house to scare you from coming here. But I'm glad you came. Nancy kicked at the man's shins and he winced with pain. Gonna fight, eh? I'll fix that, he sneered. Having tied Nancy's hands behind her, Trot now pushed the young detective down and bound her ankles. She fought desperately, but it was useless. When he had her completely at his mercy, he grinned evilly. 
Many thanks for solving the baffling mystery, he said. For a long while, I've been trying to learn where the rest of the march music was hidden. Now I'll relieve you of your precious bundle. He picked up the manuscripts, which had fallen to the floor in the scuffle, and put them under one arm. Then he reached into a pocket. I'm sorry to leave you like this, he said sardonically. But I trust that this little creature will fix you so you'll remember nothing of this episode. Nancy, squirming and twisting, did not understand what the man meant. He removed a bottle from his pocket. You wonder what this is? He jested cruelly. A black widow, my dear detective. Oh, you shudder? Then you know what it will do to you. End of chapter 18